It's my pleasure to introduce Christine Baun, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Christine is Vice President for Professional Education and Industry Engagement, and we work together I think, for 10 years now. So uh, you'll see more of us in the future. Welcome. Welcome everybody to the afternoon session. Um, just wanna start with gratitude for all of you spending your Saturday with us. It's so great to see students, alumni, industry partners, faculty, academic leadership. It's just um, incredible to see the Art Center community come together. And I'm especially honored to introduce our next speaker. Um, a little bit about this remarkable person, um, Idris. He is an incredible supporter of the college, a great collaborator, and a remarkable example of a creative technologist. Idris is also an entrepreneur, a digital architect, and CEO and founder of Spatial Labs, a technology inf infrastructure company that is powering the next generation of augmented reality, blockchain, omni-channel, and immersive experiences. Idris has collaborated on creative projects with Uber, Snapchat, Twitter, Rihanna, Travis Scott, and this month has created the world's first chip-enabled fashion magazine cover in a collaboration with Vogue. Please join me in welcoming back to Art Center, Idris Sandu. Hello, everyone. I feel so, so good to be, to be here, uh, to be back. You know, um, as Christine was saying, you know, we uh, have collaborated with Art Center frequently in the past. You know, we have a couple of different Art Center graduates that are currently at Spatial Labs helping uh, helping us envision the future. Um, and yeah, really, really excited to delve into a couple of different, you know, topics today um, centered around a lot of different things that are going on, but ultimately um, the connecting thread of the conversation being centered around empathy, centered innovation, and how we can use that as a fuel for creativity. Uh, so Spatial Labs, you know, the company that I have, you know, the crew neck on, uh, is a hardware innovations company based in Silicon Beach, California. We develop hardware and software, mostly centered around augmented reality, near field communication, spatial computing, and digital interoperability. Today, I'm going to invite you all into a conversation around design-led empathy and how it can be used as a field to unlock deep levels of innovation and how it can help not only ground our reality, but assist in redefining it for the next generation. It's been a very exciting year. The past year has been full of new discoveries and the rise of new emerging technologies. One of those key defining technologies that has been a pinnacle of conversation in the last year has been generative AI, right? Now, to kind of paint the, you know, the story of generative AI and how we got here, I often, you know, dwell on my childhood. When I was a child, I vividly remember asking myself what the world would look like in the future. Often asking myself what knowledge of the past would I need to know about the world in order to be a part of the likelihood of its future ever happening. Several programming languages later and several brand partnerships later, the future has already started to unravel. The earlier forms of AI and deep learning that most people had been accustomed to and experienced in the past are now being overwritten with new innovations to AI and machine learning each day. As I would grow up, different forms of deep learning and ML would take shape of their own gradually being embedded in almost every physical piece of technology that not only I would own, but others around me would own. Traditional document sharing uh, turned into digital PDFs. Physical mail would evolve to wet ink signatures. Um, written pages could now be copied in less than three seconds using advancements in deep learning and OCR, optical character recognition. With, and it works even with the most unrecognizable of handwritings. File organization, which used to be something that had to be manually labeled and annotated, would evolve uh, through breakthroughs in machine learning, allowing photo apps to annotate even the most disorganized of pictures. And even gaming would evolve uh, from scripted AI mechanics into dynamic gameplay influenced by unique player behavior and choice. And all this innovation 
happened pretty quickly, right? Uh, majority of this innovation happened in the latter uh, decade of my upbringing. And all this change uh, that's happening to AI and machine learning, which used to happen in silos and developer consortiums is now happening, is now happening in the public, right before our eyes, the rise of productive and consumer scale AI conceived in just a couple of years is now shipping to millions of people each day, right? And it's only the beginning of its identity, uh, an identity that even I, as someone who was part of the internet generation, would be called unto its evolution. I've been asked by those that are new to the space of AI and those that are even familiar with the space about the best way to think about the new emerging field and the best, and the best ways to get uh, involved with the new emerging space as well. And to kind of break down a lot of the advancements we're seeing in AI today, um, I like to kind of think about things in analogies. Uh, I think of the new advancements in AI, more specifically generative AI in the same vein as the human brain. Generative AI platforms uh, allow us to contextualize the human brain through analogies. Today, I can look at large language models like ChatGPT as the left side of the brain, right? The part of the brain focused on language, numerics, reason, scientific skills, and spoken language. And the right side, built on diffusion models through tools like stable diffusion represent the creativity of, the hu of humanity, generating ideas like art, images, and other forms of visual media. But the right, si the right side of the brain is not just good at creating 2D forms of art, but also envisioning 3D worlds as well. The rise of generative tools like neural radiance fields, which shifted the need for high resolution LIDAR cameras uh, to capture point cloud data for 3D scene reconstruction is quickly, being in, is quickly being enhanced by new technologies like 3D gaussian splatting techniques. Uh, but still, majority of AI that's shipped to people still, still lands in the, uh, in the, in the realm of um, a digital conversation, right? We haven't seen AI um, in you know, a majority of physical products today. It's still all digital. And more importantly, as we're all here today, where does the role of the designer fit in this conversation? How can consumer level AI be leveraged to, assi uh, be leveraged to assist designers in gaining a advantage? And where does the role of the designer fit in all the so software centered innovation as well? After all, not all knowledge has been digitized. Only a small fraction of human knowledge is on the internet. Majority of human history is still out there in the real world in designers' brains not on servers, hidden in the creative mind. Surely then the role of the designer, surely then the role of the designer in an AI driven future uh, must be one that invites us to explore more of the capacity of what design is. And I think a lot of that will be invited by this newfound relationship with empathy, using it as a force for good. Empathy and heightened levels of digital, uh, heightened levels of design consciousness, should I say, when applied to design has the potential to boost civilization way further than we've even conceived today. In its simplest and purest form, empathy not only allows us to experience and un understand another person's perspective and circumstances, but it also puts us in people's shoes to experience what they're feeling. This is where we find the innate struggle born out of user frustration and bound to the intrinsic value of their user experience. Without a doubt, empathy can serve as one of the most crucial and important design thinking principles, often being the starting topic of most successful products today, right? We hear it all the time, people saying, you know, I came up with the idea for this product after putting myself in the shoes of somebody or going through a problem that I was going through uh, myself. It's lessons that empathy can invoke. Empathy and its lessons are thoughts um, which are universal. When applied right within design, empathy becomes a compass guiding us along the path to innovation and allowing us to discover hidden elements of our users' needs, experiences, and their perspectives. This is where empathy-led research and development R&D has the ability to shape the future of emerging technologies like AI and take them to completely new heights, informed by attentive design. For the last several years, 
I've incorporated a lot of different practices into my own personal habits and the habits of those around me, specifically at Spatial Labs. Exposure is a theme that I constantly make time for as I navigate the ever-evolving space of technology and design, challenging myself to put myself into people's perspectives and not simply design for the sake of design itself. But to actually solve these problems that an overabundance and overconsumptive world creates, as Steve Jobs said, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Empathy-led design, you see, it's not just a concept. It's a core part of design itself. Empathy serves as one of the first steps in design thinking because it is a skill that allows us to understand and share the same feelings that others feel. Through empathy, we are ultimately able to put ourselves in other people's shoes and connect with how they might be feeling about the same problem, the same circumstance, or even the same situation. Empathy is the first step in design thinking because it is a skill that allows us to understand and share those feelings that others do. We achieve this empathetic state as we, as, we, um, as we put aside our own preconceived ideas about the world and choose to understand the ideas, thoughts, and needs of others around us. And especially in an attention economy, we see many consumer-facing brands and, corpor and corporations compromising on that true value of empathy, that ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes, situations. In a attention economy that continues to be fueled by corporate greed, uh, we focus more on competing for continual attention rather than solving problems in a long-term strategy. Instead of learning and exposing oneself to what others might feel, corporations instead rewire and program your brain into how to think and how to feel. A move that affects creativity by removing the individual ability to trust one's own feeling as it pertains to the perception of the world. This is the reality of the attention economy and designers now more than ever have to navigate around that uh, and to shift that frequency as they design the products of tomorrow. The role of the traditional designer is continuously shifting and evolving. And those that fail to act on empathy and use it as a superpower to channel new ideas will not make it. Now more than ever, the role of the designer requires an excessive amount of time to not fear these new technologies, but use it and its new lessons as a tool to funnel and channel new ways of thought and execution. You see today, almost every company competes to some degree on the basis of continual innovation. And to be commercially successful, new products and services and ideas must, of course, meet a real or perceived customer need. The role of the designer has not always been to listen to the, uh, to the customer. The role of the designer is to guide and invite a conversation right, through design. Sometimes customers are so accustomed to current conditions that they don't think to ask for a new solution. That's the importance of the designer in this. And that's the beauty of the role of the, de the designer, actually, to guide and invite people into a new conversation on why something should function or look differently than what it does. You must obsessively sit down as a designer before actually designing anything to ask these questions to yourself as you build the tools of tomorrow. How does your product or service fit into your user's own idiosyncratic systems, whether they be a household routine, an office operation, or even a manufacturing process? Some small changes that can result from watching people use your product in their own environment can also be competitively important as well. Empathetic design techniques can't replace market research, of course. That's something that's really, really important. Rather, they contribute to the flow of ideas that need further testing. One of the most important elements of empathy, center design, empathy centered design is the role of the observer, right? Being able to sit and analyze how the world works, why it works the way that it works, even before thinking about the solutions to changing how it works. In a lot of my talks, I often mention the 10 principles of design, you know, uh, formulated by uh, Dita Rams as a 
philosophical analogy for the role of the end product, as well as the ideas that a designer should think about as they're designing a product. Today, I wanna to borrow from these 10 principles through a new perspective though, centered around innovation through empathy specifically. So we're kind of gonna go through the 10 principles reoriented around empathy specifically. So empathy led design should be the basis of innovative design. The possibilities for innovation today are not yet exhausted. Um, something that I hear a lot from designers is, you know, platforms like ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion can come up with new ideas. And it seems like, you know, things are, you know, we're, we're running out. Um, using the gift of empathy that everyone is born with, we uniquely all have the ability to engage the world around us by contributing to ideas bigger than our own. Inventiveness starts with you, but innovation starts with a collective. Empathy-led design leads to deep overall product usefulness. In the age of AI, what is, determined, what is determined as useful will indeed vary and appear to continuously change and evolve as the role of the designer and creative itself evolves. Ultimately, the ideas that you all are uniquely in a position to solve and, uh, to solve and create a lasting impact will depend on how useful those products are. Remembering that designing for access is far than designing for excess, which is something that today you can look around you, whether in the software space, the product design space, the industrial design space, it seems as though we're designing for excess and not access. Empathy led design can lead to a balance of aesthetics and function, and it should, both leaning on each other and neither weighing more than the other. Empathy and design should seek to make a product or service more useful and understandable. One of the main advantages that we all have in this room is the gift of empathy in of itself. The ability to see the world through others' perspectives. By focusing on intentional levels of empathy, individuals that use technologies should be able to understand it better and even invite themselves to improve upon its usefulness in their own unique ways. Empathy-centered innovation should not get in the way of true self-expression. And I think this is one of the most important things that even new emerging technologies like ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion are teaching people. Ultimately, although the systems can assist you in thinking differently, um, they don't teach you how to think or what to think. That's still up to you, right? These tools are simply tools. Everything in this world can be described as a tool. It's not something that is good, nor is it bad. It depends on the usefulness of what you're going to choose to do with that tool. Um, water can you know, help quench our thirst, but it can also drown, right? Fire can assist us in cooking, but it can also burn down things. Everything's a tool. Um, and empathy-centered innovation in this way should not get in that way of self-expression. -exp the tool should not tell you what to do with the tool. Rather, you should tell yourself what you want to do with the tool. The role of the designer seems like it's moving in the direction that will influence a lot of these changes based on how people feel. In an age where digital tools continue to affect how we feel, the role of the designer should allow for freedom of true self-expression, not limited. Empathy-centered innovation must seek to deliver product usefulness all while being honest. This is probably one of my favorite you know, things. Uh, you know, noted in the 10 principles of design as principle number six, uh, good design must always be honest. As digital tools continue to be developed, a trend we've seen in the past is this notion that all your problems will be solved through this one tool. Now that I can, now that can assist as an advertisement advantage or seen as an incredible marketing approach to get people to use a service, most people abandon the product or service after they've used it up a couple of times, leaving themselves unfulfilled. And today, more than ever, a lot of products in technology centered around this new innovation makes promises to us around how they'll make us feel more full and how the usefulness of these things will unlock all of our desires only for us to feel empty, seeking human companionship and relatability. Instead, focusing more on how a product, how a product or service you're developing as a designer, you should focus more on how a product or service you're developing could solve a necessary problem very, very well. It doesn't have to solve all problems. 
globalization has affected the general creative design process. What used to be something that was, you know, bringing a high level of design to a unique product and allowing people to be invited into the conversation and seeing its usefulness turned into something where designers feel like they don't want to put things out because they want every single person to love something about that design, which ultimately affects their ability to, uh, to, to make concise decisions based off of their intentionality. Empathy-centered innovation must also allow for a design to be long-lasting. Now, this long-lasting cycle doesn't have to be about time itself. Instead, I think of it more as a completion of a cycle. The design of systems that we create under the basis of empathy should encourage people to be thorough and um, assist users in completing a task fully rather than being distracted. An example of this could be a smart fridge that has a poorly designed user interface. Due to the lack of intentionality of apps or services specifically around the things you might actually do in the kitchen, a user could find themselves lost interacting with the user interface. Psychologically, interacting with the smart TV as if it was there, uh, or interacting with the smart fridge as if it was a TV, and as if it was their own personal device, ending up playing forms of media that might ultimately distract them in an area of the home that has sharp tools and can lead to dangerous consequences. Empathy-centered design opens up a space for thoroughness. Using every aspect of a product will become much more prevalent as we seek to answer some of the largest complex questions in both local and global design systems. Today, majority of products that are developed might be able to assist you at doing one thing terribly well, or might assist you in being able to do a lot of things. And I think what's going to be very instrumental in the future of design as we think about the role of designer is to optimize around singular tasks extremely well. Empathy-centered innovation invites not only the designer, but also the user to think about the environment. In a world where we're now starting to see the longer term effects of human influenced environmental change, we must delve deeper into how the products we put out into the world affects our planet. In this new age of contextual AI specifically, the environment will not only denote to the physical world around us, the one that we can see and interact with, but also digital ones as well. If you think about social media, for example, although we spend a lot of time in these digital worlds, it tends to affect our physical world in a unique way as well. One must search deep within themselves and use the imagination they find there to elevate their designs forward, trusting your instincts. A term that we often use at Spatial Labs is the term sustainable consciousness, right? Denoting to not only the physical act of being sustainable, but thinking about sustainability as a way of life, right? And incorporating it into your daily habits, the way you think, the way you speak to others, the frequency of words you use, right? To, as Yoda would say, to do or do not, to not try. And understanding that the role of the designer, as well as the end product you ultimately put out into the world, will be influenced by the frequency of thoughts, as well as language you introduce into the design systems as you're building them. So this sustainable consciousness is a term that we invoke to symbolize not only the environmental friendliness of the products that we develop, but the mindset on a conscious level that we hope to inspire uh, the audience that we build products and services for to attain to stay within. Empathy, uh, centered innovation, opens up the possibilities of the future, rem removing a barrier for, a pos uh, for possible miscommunication or misunderstanding um, within products. At Spatial, my team and I deeply spend uh, an obsessive amount of time thinking about these new emerging technologies and how they can enhance our interaction with the physical objects of tomorrow. And we're always using empathy as a force for a lot of that change. We've been developing new tools for a couple of years now that could help understand the world around us with new forms of metadata, right? Allowing people to see the world in completely unique and new ways. Uh, generative AI is a very powerful tool. Um, we've seen it used in a variety of different ways, which are still new, but we feel that the future of AI 
will not actually take us away from our humanity, but it will allow us to be connected to it in a deep way. A huge part of that would be uh, within innovations to hardware, when we can actually use these design systems we're building to see the world in completely new ways. Uh, a trip to an art gallery would shift from just going to each painting and looking at it from a visual standpoint to spending more time in front of it because of the rich forms of metadata that can now show up as you're looking at that art, inviting you into a conversation to go deeper into the things that you experience on a daily basis. We aim to imagine a world where every object around you contains metadata around it, not just a digital represent representation of data that is locked somewhere on a server. A world where each unique physical object that you might have behaves as a IoT, an internet of things connecting device, allowing you to connect with its origin and connect you deeper to its essence, encouraging more people to think about the products that they buy and the services that they use in a much more intentional and conscious way. We're developing a lot of new multimodal vision tools and models that can take scene understanding as a context, allowing you to essentially search the web through the lens of your camera or via speech in lieu of your fingers and keyboard. These aren't very natural ways of communicating, right? When you wanna talk to someone and ask them a question, you can type the question or you can ask them. Uh, the rise of generative, contextual, and spatially aware AI, even as crazy as might seem, is still only at its beginning. But even with the earliest glimpse of its promises, it's most certainly here to stay. What we choose to do with this newfound evolution towards an established identity is truly open to us all, um, and it's up to us. I remain excited and well motivated by what's to come. And I trust you all feel the same as we co collectively work together to not only redefine the future, but use empathy as a connecting force to do so. Thank you. Part one. Okay. <laughs> uh, now we, you know, wanted to open up space for any questions that anyone might have um, related to empathy-centered innovation. Um, AI or anything that was mentioned um, in the talk. Um, I like to split the time between actually speaking around a, a specific uh, particular topic and then opening up to the audience, um, engaging in a more intentional um, conversation instead of a, a monologue. Um, so I'm going to be like on this side uh, and grab a, grab a handheld mic over here for any questions that anyone Right. Okay. Thank um, you so by much. the way, that was amazing. I just, I love that you came from it, from an empathy. And I think that we have such a new normal um, that we're really facing in our world right now with, with lots of different reasons. Um, neurodiversity being one of those things. So anyway, I would love to know an example of successful products that's you that have used empathy centered innovation in your opinion, and also maybe an example that failed that could be redesigned to really approach something for our society. That's a very great question. Um, I'm like about to put some companies on blast and stuff. It's like, sorry, no. you need to be like in that company. Yeah, it's going to be very more abstract. Um, I think you know something that's really exciting to me is the role of empathy for future designers. Right. Um, I think a lot of those products that had been created that I would usually denote to being you know non empathy centered have the ability to be recreated by the next generation. Um, for example, um, a lot of how we think about uh, how we uh, design uh, for public safety, right? Um, I think a, a lot of this and a lot of accessibility um, can be rethought through the, uh, through the introduction of a lot of these new emerging technologies, especially in vision. Um, smart glasses, right, are one of those ways that I feel like you know, in the past we've seen like, you know, like the Google Glass. And I think that was like something that, you know, it it was so in intentionally thought of as an enhancement, an enhanced tool, but it became more of like a distractive tool. Right. Um, and it takes a insane amount of time to um design for I would say like peripheral vision, right? Um we you know, even with a lot of things that we're going to see with, um, you know, the Vision Pro, um, 
a lot of it has been on the basis of rethinking how we design for spatial environments and introducing new forms of human interface design to do that. Um, so yeah, I would say like for me, I think technologies like that, ones that are designed to solve sort of this unified human problem, which is centered around context are things that in the past have failed, but we really have a unique advantage today with the technologies that we have and um, an amalgamation of tools like, you know, generative AI, um, deep learning, um, and even the innovations in hardware to kind of shift that in a unique way. So I would say like the Google Glass was cool. It didn't work, but we have the, we have the ability to reapproach it now in a much more empathy centered way. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Hello. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I, I was hoping if you could shed some light on how you can use um, like design process or methodology to integrate this attitude towards creation of uh, empathy and understanding. For sure. I mean, the thing is, uh, even throughout the talk, empathy and our ability to understand empathy, it's not a, um, I would say there's no singular global way of identifying empathy. It's something that's interpersonal. It's going to be shaped by the conversations you have with your friends, your family, your unique view and perspective on the world. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, m you know, made the our team, I'm not going to put some of our team members on blast here. I, I made our team watch the movie Arrival, uh, you know, last two weeks again for like the hundredth time. And really you know, thought about the connective theme of that movie around empathy and feeling and searching how you feel inside and using that as an expressive tool. Um, and I think um, your unique perspective and the things that you've been able to see, whether it's through conversation, whether it's through observation, um, are more are more unique right? And are things that I think the designer should invoke more of as they're thinking about the products that they're creating. Um, I think it's like one of those things where empathy becomes much more of searching your true feelings on the inside than it is following these principles, right? Because um, it's, it's, it's more of an interpersonal viewing of the world. Um, as, it, as, it, um, as it pertains to uh, certain design, you know, whether principles or techniques, um, something that I not only, you know, incorporate into my, you know, design thinking process, but the teams is the value of exposure and observation before thinking about creating anything. Um, so we would spend like weeks, months, just learning, like literally learning about things before changing. Um, an example that I give sometimes is, uh, I remember when I went back to Ghana and I was like working on, um, I'm building a school out there. And when I first went, I didn't really think about how um, something that we might view as a norm here might not be a norm there, right? So it's like, we were like, oh, the curriculums are going to be like, you know, um, video based, right? Um, so students can like take it home and all this stuff. And over here, majority of people have access to like what you, you pay like a, you know, monthly fee and you have unlimited internet, right? So the idea of a lot of the things that we think about here, for example, Netflix or Instagram and stuff, it works better because our economy, majority of people have access to a certain bandwidth of internet, but going out there saying like, oh, this curriculum is free. is still not free out there because people have to buy data bundles to get access to it. So for example, that's, that's like one of those ways that I feel like even, um, as I was saying, sitting with an observation and you know thinking about your own personal sort of experience can help you shape the products of the future by tapping into that empathy um in a unique way um i think my ability to see the world is unique and your ability to see the world is unique um so we can't really like compare them and be like oh well this is how i see the world and this is how you see the world and here's the you know here's like our common way of seeing it um, but my unique perspective around just going and observing and seeing how people would go and buy data bundles influenced my ability to rethink about this whole entire school and curriculum in a unique way. Yeah. Um, just to follow up. So 
in the creation of or your design process of creating either new products or improving on your existing ones uh i'm curious to know how do you guys as a team integrate the user into your process like how do you do you have people come in and try the products or like and how do you add the empathy in every step of the way yeah. to make sure it's like centered around that user experience yeah i mean it's a it's a very that's a really good question right because you can think of empathy as something that is like okay well you know if each of us has our own ability to express ourselves and our ideas and something that i might like it might be something that you you don't like at what point do we kind of yeah. say like all right well this is a collective you know empathy model that we're going to build this product around um uh, at Spatial, because we do tend to develop a lot of technology that we want to scale across, you know, a global system, um, we incorporate a lot of body storming into a lot of our um, a lot of our development. Given that we're like working on, you know, VR systems and things like that, um, we instead of using focus groups, we really just identify users that are interested in the in the technologies and really sit down. And I think that's what sometimes either engineering or design focus um, companies, especially at scale, have a hard time with. Because um, sometimes you might really believe in this idea you have. You might really want to just get it out there. And you might compromise on certain values right? Um, that, you, that you shouldn't have um, or you shouldn't. Um, a lot of that can be seen, for example, in more advanced technologies like BMIs or BCIs, brain computer interfaces or brain machine interfaces um, with even like, for example, like what Neuralink is doing, right? Where, you know, there's a level of inviting or peer reviewing a lot of the technology that you're developing um, and not forgetting that human level and that human essence um, as part of that. So um, for us, we invite um, all different types of people. Um, we like, if you watch Silicon Valley, you know, when Richard created you know, the middle out compression algorithm, he was like, it's so great and it works, but it's like, oh, the reason why you're getting all this great feedback is because you're only showing it to engineers. <laughs> like that's of course, like they all voted for this thing. And so for us, um, we don't, everyone at the company, we don't uh, really look at um, ourselves as um, superior in any way because we're building a product. Um, we listen to everyone um, as long as they're like really, interested in any level to the product, you'll be surprised actually, like with people that are not traditional at whatever you're creating, you'll get the best feedback from it, yeah. you know, and it's, and it's, and it's so great. So yeah, like, you know, our brainstorming, body storming, you know, sort of um, design process is something that we, 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 we like to do. And not only just translating the questions that we get from people, um, but we do a lot of uh, in-house R and D. Right. So we don't just like, oh, what do you think about hypothetically if there were some glasses um, that somebody had like or it could let you do this? What do you think about it? And in theory, a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, I think that would be cool or no, I'm, I don't really like that. But we do our best to commit as much time as possible to um, putting prototypes in people's hands, even if it's not completed. And uh, based off of that constructive feedback, you know, we iterate over time, iterate over that success over time. Um. I have yet another question. I <laughs> but, you, I, all right, let's get it. Yeah, I'm pretty curious about this stuff. So, uh, like the adoption curve yeah. for products in general, um, for such a new space, such as, um, you know, virtual reality and stuff, mm -hmm. obviously it's uh, coming into the mainstream, like Apple just pushed their own mm -hmm. headset. But um, how do you plan to change the way you do things at Spatial Labs as you go along that curve? You know, it's like early adopters and then the mainstream and then goes down again. So how do you adapt um, the way that you work or the way that the company operates as you go along that curve? That's a very good question. I'm like, Steven, like would be the best to answer that question. You know, former art center alumni, by the way. Um, yeah, I think um, what I, what's particularly so interesting to me about empathy center design is how much it humbles you. Um, it's like, it really, really humbles you, right? Cause it's like, everybody's working on this thing and they're like, this is, everyone's own thing is like this is the most important innovation and in design since the you know beginning of civilization and i think something that has happened today with a lot of new emerging technologies is people attempt to overhype the technology and as a subset 
on a psychological level, the users or early adopters that are your initial audience that want to support this thing, they feel that their needs are unmet once they use it and it reduces the likelihood of them trying it ever again um, versus or in lieu, should I say? See, so it's like that frequency thing. I was saying, I don't want to say versus in lieu of thinking about it like this thing is not ready for global adoption and multimodal adoption, but it's really good at doing this one thing. And I think what you've even seen with like Apple, right, is they didn't approach kind of like VR as like, or AR for that matter, as this thing that's going to like allow you to do everything. They specifically were like, we're kind of tearing this around entertainment, right? And entertainment device, we see this replacing your TV. And I think that single centered approach and level of focus um, that I feel like a lot of people lack, right? Because you want the product you're working on to solve everything. No, no, it's like focusing on that one specific use case and nailing it and delivering on that promise and getting people to, you know, um, have a insane amount of level of joy when they use it for that particular thing. And then expanding into other spaces is something that um, we, you know, we, we do, we do a lot of. So as it pertains to the ever evolving space of AR, VR, spatial computing, you know, and all the other terms related to that, that <laughs> field, um, we humble ourselves and invite other people to give us a lot of feedback um, around the particular use case that we're, we're, we're solving for um, rather than this technology is going to change the world and it's the future. And it's like, we're decades out from that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. Let's clap for me. He gave like some really, really good questions. Maybe like give super long answers because the questions are so good. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Um, and yeah, big fan of empathy. I've, I've been in uh, spaces where I've needed to empathize with somebody who voted for somebody who I thought was going to be a dictator or somebody who had just told me that they were abusing their children. Have you ever found the limits or challenges in empathizing for someone? And then how did you overcome it? That's a very great question. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you like even brought it up. Um, it goes back into like, I think one of the, uh, I think the second or the first question, which was like, where's the limit, right? As it pertains to, to empathy. Um, because even op the ability to empathize or the ability for um, someone to be, or to have an emotional IQ enough or EQ enough to empathize in of itself is based off of someone's own unique observation and you have to use discernment right and if you haven't been someone that has been able to discern it can be easy for you to not only agree but be in favor of things that might you know not not be something that um uh you sh you should be agreeing with um so i think it's like you know for for me i think the role of a designer or an engineer um is something that i don't really look at as a I look at it more of as a privilege than I do think of it as like more of an authority. And to be in that position to me requires an insane amount of observation and learning. So whenever we're create, whether we're creating or not, um, I'm known for like just traveling to random locations and learning and just listening to people. Um, Cause you know, the most exposed it's not like the most educated but it's the most exposed especially in today's world it's the most exposed because sometimes like you know with education it's like you can become uneducated the moment your educator becomes uneducated right so it's like exposing yourself to as much um of the problems and topics at hand when solving any problem puts you in a position ultimately um to use your discernment in the best way um and in moments where you can't instinctually even trust on your own discernment working or speaking with other people um, as your kind of moral compass on that. And that's also happened even with me, you know, with uh, some ideas where I'll be like, yo, like I talked to this person from the accessibility community around this particular thing. And I don't really have the answer in this. Do we compromise on this feature um, and then open this up? Or is it something that we kind of like limited on this? And trusting the instincts of those that you put around you sometimes assist assist in doing that thank you Good thank answer. you are you still 
Hello. Oh, <laughs> like every. <laughs> um. First of all, Hello. thank you for being here. Thank you for having. Um, I appreciated your description of emerging technologies as neutral can be used either way. Um, I would say it seems like oftentimes designers, creators, what have you right now are in this sort of rock in a hard place situation where um, we we come to our projects with a mindset of trying to be empathetic for end users, for what is this supposed to do? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, but it seems that there is often a disconnect between the teams that are creating and the people who enable this company leaders who are more interested in how designing for empathy can increase capital. So how can, how can we arm creatives to combat a mindset that is so rooted in the bottom dollar? And how can we change minds for people who really only are interested in that as the be all end all? That's a very, very great question. And I think it's something that's more of a pre prevalent problem we see, um, especially across like, you know, large corporations where it makes sense to introduce certain levels of conversation for, you know, productivity or some form of capitalism, right? For example, it's like diversity, right? It's like, you know, after certain events and like every company has like a head of diversity and inclusion all of a sudden, right? But um, I think... Uh, I don't have the, I feel like uh, I don't have the, um, I would say I don't have the full answer to that. And what I can um, speak on is how at the company that I lead, right, how we've in integrated that at Spatial Labs. Like, and I think it, it's a lot of it is deeply rooted into how teams are built, right? I have a lot of, you know, um, or even people um, that work at Spatial that would come from another company and say, wow, I really love the ability for us to have conversations and everything be on the table here rather than like, you know, feeling like there's a hierarchy of, okay, if I feel like this is something that we should definitely think more about as it pertains to perhaps like a topic like accessibility, um, it's a conversation that's had and we as a collective team sit down and then solve that thing. It's not like a kind of, because, you know, that's the thing that happens sometimes with designers, right? You have like some of the most talented people in the world that can solve so many of the problems that the world goes through. And they're like bottlenecked and put into the system at a company that cares nothing about the world. And they're like, you know, like it's like an episode of severance where as soon as they like go in, they're like, okay, let me act like I don't care about all these things. And then they go back and they're like, my heart isn't there. You know, I can't do certain things. So at Spatial, um, the role of empathy and the role of thinking about, um, you know, uh, defining great user experience uh, is something that we put in front of everything. And it's not like, a well, if you incorporate empathy into your company, you can make more money. Um, globalization and the role of designers, especially when it comes to big um, big companies, kind of started a lot of the whole like people feeling like you can no longer work on a product that's great for just a specific community of people that want to use that product. And instead, because it's like someone on TikTok or something that like comes across your product might be like, oh, I don't like this thing. Like people want to design for less around like, I feel like, you know, um, solving issues but more so like getting ahead of the problems that people might come up with and i feel like a lot of that um also affects the overall design 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 process um when people come up with things but at spatial for us there's no like hierarchy of you know um people feeling like they can't incorporate um levels of pure empathy into the design um design process um and uh i think that's something that if we want to have the conversation it's teams should be structured differently um oftentimes a lot of like kind of the at least what i've seen um is the empathy centered conversations or the accessibility centered conversations kind of happen later right not at the beginning um and we do our best to incorporate them you know in the beginning and then use that uh, to deliver on our products i appreciate your honesty and thank you for being the change thank you Well, first, thank you so much. This is like totally mind blowing. And yet it's so encouraging and positive. 
I wanted to ask you, I mean, I've read your bio and I've known all the amazing things you've done, but can you um, share with us, uh, with us some of your inspiration, some of the way you live through life? Because you're like way up here. How do you ground yourself? How do you, um, I mean, what kind of music do you listen to? Whatever you could share with us that will give us a little bit of a person out your personality. That's a, that's a great, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for seeing me. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, um, you know, everyone knows this about me. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm someone that has a very vivid personality and, um, for me, I think even the answers that you might be getting, you might be like, okay, maybe those might be like really deep questions. Um, it's an aspect of me in of itself. It's like my part of, it's the part of my essence, the designers that I choose to ultimately be influenced by, for example, Dita Rams, right. Which like, you know, Vito Braun, Johnny Ive, Wally B, I'm creating the Airstreams, Metal, Apple ends up using the first, I like being inspired by the first, you know, what, what Wally B did, you know, with reusing like, uh, you know, a lot of aerospace materials into the Airstreams that were very popular in the 1960s and 70s, you know, like for me, like growing up, even as it pertains to design or other topics, I never was kind of in a conversation for the sake of the conversation or because it was the most popular designer at that time. It was people that I could research and see that they had like a more philosophical approach to their design and wanting to change the world. Um, for example, I love the light and space movement of the 1960s where you had like people like Robert Irwin and you had like Ted and Pastian, you know, James Terrell. That was like, how can we raise the vibrational consciousness of people through light and space and sound? So a lot of my personality actually is like, it's influenced by a lot of different like people that they got to incorporate their level of design um, or their, uh, yeah, incorporate their level of design, but like you can feel this like purpose, right, with it. And that's like one of the most important things to me, right? Feeling like a grounded level of purpose. And, you know, the conversation has never been to be a designer or engineer for the sake of it. It's been to invite a new level of conversation for someone in the same way that like the first time, like, I watched 2001 Space Odyssey and actually this happened, let me be honest, it happened the second time. The second time I watched 2001 Space Odyssey, I sat down and watched the full credits and I'm looking at all the credits and then I saw this guy like James Terrell, you know, cause he would like worked on 2001 Space Odyssey on lighting design and then did more research into it and was like, okay, these, you know, it's all about healing, right? So I think um, a lot of like my personality, the music I would even listen to everything has to be things that put you in a specific type of vibration, right? I can't, like, it's like listening to a very non-high frequency type of music while designing will completely throw you off, right? So it's the same exact thing for me. It's more of like a way of life and majority of my personality is invoked by a lot of different teachings of people that were highly philosophical and applied that into their design thinking, their overall worldview, their contribution, their purpose. Yeah. So it's well, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi again. I think I'll close with maybe the last question. Um, you mentioned you're the school that you're building in Ghana. And um, I wondered if you could share a little bit about the intention behind that project and what you're hoping to to build and the types of students you're hoping to reach. That's a that's a great last question. <laughs> See, um, yeah. So it's interesting. Like I I know I'm 26 and like people are like what you're building a school and stuff. It's like um, I think that uh you know my upbringing. Uh, my my mom primarily raised me. You know, we grew up in you know Compton before moving to Harbor City, which are you know, like two very like poor communities. And growing up, like I loved playing basketball. I was really good at baseball. I was really good at sports and everything. But I always had this thing for like, uh, why does the world work the way that it works, and what can I do to shift it and change it? And ultimately, after basketball. I was the kid that would like want to go to the library and 
something that I realized was different is like when I would go to like Compton Community Library or the Harbor City Library or Redondo Beach Library, when I would go to the computer, there wasn't like a computer science section even. It was all, it was just tech. It was like technology. And the books there were like beaten and old and it's like Lisa programming language. And it's like 2012. Why are we like, why do we have books on things that are no longer used? And then when I moved to a more of like a middle-class neighborhood, I would actually see that there was like a computer science section now. And I could pick up more books on things that were current. And that thinking is what shaped my influence into thinking about designing a school and thinking about the access to the information that people have at that time. One of the things that I observed was in specific places, right? Because like Africa is huge and Ghana in particular is also really huge. There were places where like, you know, the uh, teachers when they were teaching their kids like Microsoft Word, which like most people don't even like most people use like some form of cloud-based system, cloud -based, like Google Docs or something, right? The teacher would just like draw the user interface on the chalkboard, like would draw it and then be like, okay, so when you click this button, this is what happens. And then we'll spend another five minutes drawing the sub menu that shows up when this is clicked on. So there was like a huge disparity in information bandwidth. So by the time the teacher, like the teacher could only like teach one topic over the course of the day. So the bandwidth was there. And, that, and if you look at this at scale, do you think those like children that, you know, went through that class would get as much as information as other kids that are able to learn quicker? So, so that's something that I realized that the bandwidth of how fast people could learn was limited. And we needed to rethink about that. Um, and I wanted to do it in a really, really unique way that kind of like symbolized this tech innovation happening in this place where people wouldn't describe or think about innovation first, you know, Africa is a very big place. Ghana, you know, where I was born, uh, was one of the first, I mean, the first African country to gain its independence, you know, in 1957, you know, by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And he even like had this study with like Marcus Garvey and stuff like that to think differently about, you know, uh, the, the nation at whole. So the school for me feels like the ultimate amalgamation of everything I've been able to learn and acquire over the years in tech and all this stuff and taking that high frequency and then like taking it and giving it to them. You know, the curriculums are like designed to get the most out of topics so people can start iterating and designing there. It's hardware focused. Um, I feel like a lot of innovations um, are backed by hardware. You know, we have millions of the app, millions of apps in the store. Everyone here has like their favorite apps, but you access those apps through a primary device. So hardware centered innovation is going to be like really, really big um, at that school. And then we have like, yeah, just some really cool stuff that I'm willing. Um, I'm really excited for you to say there's like meditation rooms that students can go into that are inspired by like Helen Pastian and James Terrell and um yeah, it's it's gonna be really, 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 really exciting for us to take that frequency out there. Cause I think about myself now being 26 and the first time that I like came across like even Wally Beam, you know, with the and learned about airstreams or, you know, when I was thinking about like, you know, Joseph Eichler and the homes that he built in San Francisco that were designed to use natural light instead of like having, you know, electricity need to run during the day, I wanted to take a lot of that frequency back there to expose people in those same ways. Because if I was like, if I did it at, you know, 14 or 15, someone should be able to do it at eight. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was like the main inspiration. It was about to equalize and democratize access to quality education, um, which I think right now there is an insanely huge disparity um, based off of not even just the tools, the bandwidth to how fast people can access those tools.